As soon as Cortez understood what the chiefs were telling him, he said that he had already explained to them that our lord the king had sent him to chastise evildoers, and that he would not permit either sacrifice or robbery, and that as these tax gatherers had made this demand, he ordered them to make prisoners of them at once, and to hold them in custody until their lord Montezuma should be told the reason, namely, how they had come to rob them and carry off their wives and children as slaves and commit other violence. When the caciques heard this, they were thunderstruck at such daring. What? Were the messengers of the great Montezuma to be maltreated? They said that they were too much afraid and did not dare do it. But Cortez went on impressing on them that the messenger should be thrown into prison at once. And so it was done, and in such a way that, with some long poles and collars, such as are in use among them, they secured them so they could not escape and they flogged one of them who would not allow himself to be bound. Then Cortez ordered all the caciques to pay no more tribute or obedience to Montezuma, and to make proclamation to that effect in all their friendly and allied towns, and if any tax-gatherers came to their other towns, to inform him of it, and he would send for them. So the news was known throughout that province, where the fat cacique promptly sent messengers to spread the tidings, and the chiefs who had come in company with the tax-gatherers, as soon as they had seen him taken prisoners, noised it abroad, before each one returned to his own town in order to deliver the order, and relate what had happened. When they witnessed deeds so marvelous, and of such importance to themselves, they said that no human beings would dare to do such things. It was the work of tools, for so they call the idols which they worship. And for this reason, from that time forth, they called us tools. Which is as much to say that we were either gods or demons. I must go back and tell about the prisoners. It was the advice of all the caciques that they should be sacrificed so that none of them could return to Mexico to tell the story. But when Cortez heard this, he said that they should not be killed and that he would take charge of them, and he set some of our soldiers to guard them. At midnight, Cortez sent for these soldiers who were in charge and said to them, See to it that two of the prisoners are loosened, the two that appear to you the most intelligent, in such a way that the Indians of this town shall know nothing about it. And he told them to bring the prisoners to his lodging. When the prisoners came before him, he asked them, through our interpreters, why they were prisoners and what country they came from as though he knew nothing about them. They replied that the caciques of Sempoala and of this town, with the aid of their followers and ours, had imprisoned them, and Cortez answered that he knew nothing about it and was sorry for it, and he ordered food to be brought them and talked in a very friendly manner to them, and told them to return at once to the Lord Montezuma and tell him that we were all his good friends and entirely at his service, and that, lest any harm should happen to them, he had taken them from their prison, and had quarreled with the caciques who had seized them, and that anything he could do to serve them he would do with the greatest good will, and that he would order the three Indians, their companions, who were still held prisoners, to be freed and protected, that they too should go away at once, and not turn back to be captured and killed. The two prisoners replied that they valued his mercy and said they still had fear of falling into the hands of their enemies as they were obliged to pass through their territory. And so Cortez ordered six sailors to take them in a boat during the night a distance of four leagues and set them on friendly ground beyond the frontier of Zempoala. When the morning came, the caciques of the town and the fat cacique found that the two prisoners were missing. They were all the more intent on sacrificing those that remained. If Cortez had not put it out of their power and pretended to be enraged at the loss of the two who had escaped, he ordered a chain to be brought from the ships and bound the prisoners to it, and then ordered them to be taken on board ship, saying that he himself would guard them, as such bad watch had been kept over the others. When they were once on board, he ordered them to be freed from their chains, and with friendly words he told them that he would soon send them back to Mexico. Then... All the caciques of this town and of Sempoala, and all the other Totonac chiefs who had assembled, asked Cortez what was to be done, for all the force of the great Montezuma and of Mexico would descend upon them, and they could not escape death and destruction. Cortez replied with the most cheerful countenance that he and his brothers, who were here with him, would defend them, and would kill anyone who wished to molest them. 
Then the caciques and other townsmen vowed one and all that they would stay by us in everything we ordered them to do, and would join their forces with ours against Montezuma and all his allies. Then, in the presence of Diego de Godoy, the scribe, they pledged obedience to his majesty, and messengers were sent to relate all that had happened to the other towns in that province. And as they no longer paid any tribute, and no more tax-gatherers appeared, there was no end to the rejoicing at being rid of that tyranny. As soon as we had made this federation in friendship with more than twenty of the hill towns, known as the towns of the Totonacs, which at this time rebelled against the great Montezuma and gave their allegiance to his majesty and offered to serve us, we determined with their ready help at once to found the Villa Rica de la Veracruz on a plain half a league from this fortress-like town called Quihuitzlan, and we laid out plans of a church, marketplace, and arsenals, and all those things that are needed for a town, and we built a fort, and from the laying of the foundations until the walls were high enough to receive the woodwork, loopholes, watchtowers, and barbicans, we worked with the greatest haste. Cortez himself was the first to set to work to carry out the earth and stone on his back, and to dig foundations, and all his captains and soldiers followed his example, and we kept on laboring without pause so as to finish the work quickly, some of us digging foundations and others building walls, carrying water, working in the lime kilns, making bricks and tiles, or seeking for food. Others worked at the timber, and the blacksmiths, for we had two blacksmiths with us, made nails. In this way we all labored without ceasing, from the highest to the lowest, the Indians helping us, so that the church and some of the houses were soon built, and the fort almost finished. While we were thus at work, it seems that the great Montezuma heard the news in Mexico about the capture of his tax-gatherers and the rebellion against his rule, and how the Totonac towns had withdrawn their allegiance and risen in revolt. He showed much anger against Cortez and all of us, and had already ordered a great army of warriors to make war on the people who had rebelled against him, and not to leave a single one of them alive. He was also getting ready to come against us with a great army with many companies. Just at this moment there arrived two Indian prisoners whom Cortez had ordered to be set free, and when Montezuma knew that it was Cortez who had taken them out of prison and had sent them to Mexico, and when he heard the words and promises which he had sent them to report, it pleased our Lord God that his anger was appeased, and he resolved to send and gather news of us. For this purpose he dispatched his two young nephews under the charge of four old men who were caciques of high rank, and sent them a present of gold and cloth, and told his messengers to give thanks to Cortez for freeing his servants. On the other hand, he sent many complaints, saying that it was owing to our protection that those towns had dared to commit such a great treason as to refuse to pay him tribute and to renounce their allegiance to him, and that now, having respect for what he knew to be true, that we were those whom his ancestors had foretold were to come to their country, and must therefore be of his own lineage, how was it that we were living in the houses of these traitors? He did not at once send to destroy them, but the time would come when they would not brag of such acts of treason. Cortez accepted the gold and the cloth, which was worth more than two thousand dollars, and he embraced the envoys and gave us as an excuse that he and all of us were very good friends of the Lord Montezuma, and that it was as his servant that he still kept guard over the three tax-gatherers, and he sent at once to have them brought from the ships, where they had been well treated and well clothed, and he delivered them up to the messengers. Then Cortez, on his part, complained greatly of Montezuma, and told the envoys how the governor, Pitalpitoque, had left the camp one night without giving him notice, which was not well done, and that he believed and felt certain that the Lord Montezuma had not authorized any such meanness, and that it was on account of this that we had come to these towns, where we were now residing, and where we had been well treated by the inhabitants. And he prayed him to pardon the disrespect of which the people had been guilty. As to what he said about the people no longer paying tribute, they could not serve two masters, and during the time we had been there they had rendered service to us in the name of our Lord and King. But as he... Cortez and all his brethren were on the way to visit him, and placed themselves at his service, that when we were once there, then his commands would be attended to. When this conversation and more of the same nature was over, 
Cortez ordered blue and green glass beads to be given to the two youths, who were caciques of high rank, and to the four old men who had come in charge of them, who were also chieftains of importance, and bade them every sign of honor. And as there were some good meadows in the neighborhood, Cortez ordered Pedro de Alvarado, who had a good and very handy sorrel mare, and some of the other horsemen, to gallop and skirmish before the caciques, who were delighted at the sight of their galloping. And they then took leave of Cortez, and of all of us well contented, and returned to Mexico. About this time Cortez's horse died, and he bought or was given another, El Arriero, a dark chestnut which belonged to Ortiz, the musician, and Bartolome Garcia, the miner. It was one of the best of the horses that came in the fleet. I must stop talking about this and relate that as to those towns of the Sierra are allies, and the town of Sempoala had hitherto been very much afraid of the Mexicans, believing that the great Montezuma would send his great army of warriors to destroy them. When they saw the kinsmen of the great Montezuma arriving with the presence I have mentioned, and paying such marked respect to Cortez and to all of us, they were fairly astounded, and the caciques said to one another that we must be Teulis, for Montezuma had fear of us, and had sent us presents of gold, if we already had reputation for valor, from this time forth. It was greatly increased. As soon as the Mexican passengers had departed, the fat cacique, with many other friendly chieftains, came to beg Cortez to go at once to a town named Singapasinka, two days' journey from Sempuala, that is about eight or nine leagues, as there were many warriors of the Mexicans assembled there, who were destroying their crops and plantations, and were waylaying and ill-treating their vassals, and doing other injuries. Cortez believed the story as they told it so earnestly. He had promised that we would help them, and would destroy the Kaluas and other Indians who might annoy them, and noting with what importunity they pressed their complaints, he did not know what to answer them, unless it were to say that he would willingly go, or send some soldiers under one of us to turn these Mexicans out. As he stood there thinking the matter over, he said laughingly to some of his companions who were with him, do you know, gentlemen, that it seems to me that we have already gained a great reputation for valor throughout this country, and that from what they saw us do in the matter of Montezuma's tax gatherers, the people here take us for gods, or beings like their idols. I am thinking that, so as to make them believe that one of us is enough to defeat those Indian warriors, their enemies, who they say are occupying the town with the fortress, that we will send Heredia against them. Now... This old man was a Biscayan musketeer who had had a bad twitch in his face, a big beard, a face covered with scars, and was blind of one eye and lame of one leg. Cortez sent for him and said, Go with these caciques to the river, which is a quarter of a league distant, and when you get there, stop to drink and wash your hands, and fire a shot from your musket, and then I will send to call you back. I want this to be done because the people here think that we are gods, or at least they have given us that name and reputation, and as you are ugly enough, they will believe that you are such an idol. Heredia did what he was told, for he was an intelligent and clever man who had been a soldier in Italy, and Cortez sent for the fat cacique and the other chieftains, who were waiting for his help and assistance, and said to them, I am sending this brother of mine with you to kill or expel all the Kuluas from this town you speak of, and to bring me here as prisoners all who refuse to leave. The caciques were surprised when they heard this, and did not know whether to believe it or not, but seeing that Cortez never changed his face, they believed that what he told them was true. So old Heredia shouldered his musket and set out with them, and he fired shots into the air as he went through the forest, so that the Indians might see and hear him and the cacique sent word to the other towns that they were bringing along a tule to kill all the Mexicans who were in Sincapasinga. I tell this story here merely as a laughable incident, and to show the wiles of Cortez. When Cortez knew that Heredia had reached the river that he had been told about, he sent in haste to call him back. And when old Heredia and the caciques had returned, he told them that on account of the good will he bore them, that he, Cortez himself, would go in person with some of his brethren to afford them the help they needed, and visit the country and fortress. And he ordered them at once to bring one hundred Indian carriers to transport the tapusques, that is, the cannon, and they came early the next morning, 
and we set out that same day with four hundred men and fourteen horsemen and crossbowmen and musketeers who were all ready. When the officers went to warn certain soldiers of the party of Diego Velasquez to go with us, and those who had them to bring their horses, they answered haughtily that they did not want to go on any expedition, but back to their farms and estates in Cuba, that they had already lost enough through Cortez having enticed them from their homes, and that he had promised them on the sand dunes that whosoever might wish to leave, that he would give them permission to do so, and a ship and stores for the voyage, and for that reason there were now seven soldiers all ready to return to Cuba. When Cortez heard this, he sent to summon these men before him, and when he asked them why they were doing such a mean thing, they replied somewhat indignantly, and said that they wandered at his honor with so few, few soldiers under his command, wishing to settle in a place where there were reported to be such thousands of Indians and such great towns, that as for themselves they were invalids and could hardly crawl from one place to another, and that they wished to return to their homes and estates in Cuba, and they asked him to grant them leave to depart, as he had promised that he would do. Cortez answered them gently that it was true that he had promised it, but that they were not doing their duty in deserting from their captain's flag, and then he ordered them to embark at once without delay, and assigned a ship to them and ordered them to be furnished with cassava bread and a jar of oil and such other supplies as we possessed. When these people were ready to set sail, all of us comrades and the alcaldes and regidores of our town of Villarica went and begged Cortez on no account to allow anyone to leave the country, for in the interest of the service of our Lord God and His Majesty, any person asking for such permission should be considered as deserving the punishment of death, in accordance with military law, as a deserter from his captain and his flag in time of war and peril, especially in this case, when, as they had stated, we were surrounded by such a great number of towns, peopled by Indian warriors. Cortez acted as though he wished to give them leave to depart, but in the end he revoked the permission, and they remained baffled and even ashamed of themselves. We set out on our expedition to Sincapasinga, and slept that night at the town of Sempuala. Two thousand Indian warriors, divided into four commands, were all ready to accompany us, and on the first day we marched five leagues in good order. The next day, a little after dusk, we arrived at some farms near the town of Sincapasinga, and the natives of the town heard the news of our coming. When we had already begun the ascent to the fortress and houses, which stood amid great cliffs and crags, eight Indian chieftains and priests came out to meet us peacefully, and asked Cortez, with tears, why he wished to kill and destroy them when they had done nothing to deserve it. That we had the reputation of doing good to all, and of relieving those who had been robbed, and we had imprisoned the tax-gatherers of Montezuma. That these Sempuala Indians who accompanied us were hostile to them on account of old enmities over the land claims and boundaries, and under our protection they had come to kill and rob them. It was true, they said, that there was formerly a Mexican garrison in the town, but that they had left for their own country a few days earlier when they heard that we had taken the other tax gatherers prisoner, and they prayed us not to let the matter go any further, but to grant them protection. When Cortez thoroughly understood what they had said through Doña Marina and Aguilar, without delay he ordered Captain Pedro de Alvarado and Quartermaster Cristobal de Olid, and all of us comrades were with him, to restrain the Indians of Zempuala and prevent them from advancing, and this we did. But although we made haste to stop them, they had already begun to loot the farms. This made Cortez very angry, and he sent for the captains who had command of the Zempuala warriors, and with angry words and serious threats, he ordered them to bring the Indian men and women and cloths and poultry that they had stolen from the farms, and forbade any Sempoala Indian to enter the town, and said that for having lied and for having come under our protection merely to rob and sacrifice their neighbors, they were deserving of death. They should keep their eyes wide open in order that such a thing did not happen again, otherwise he would not leave one of them alive. Then the caciques and captains of the Sempoalans brought to Cortez everything they had seized, both Indian men and women and poultry, and he gave them all back to their owners, and with a face full of wrath he turned to the Sempoalans and ordered them to retire and sleep in the fields, and this they did. When the caciques and priests of that town saw how just we were in our dealings, and heard the affectionate words that Cortez spoke to them through our interpreters, including matters concerning our holy religion, which it was always our custom to explain, 
and his advice to them to give up human sacrifices and robbing one another, and the worship of their cursed idols, and much other good counsel which he gave them. They showed such good will towards us that they at once sent to call together the people of the neighboring towns, and all gave their fealty to his majesty. They soon began to utter many complaints against Montezuma, just as the people of Sempoala had done. On the next morning, Cortez sent to summon the captains and the caciques of Sempoala, who were waiting in the fields to know what we should order them to do. And, still in terror of Cortez on account of the lies they had told him, when they came before him, he made them make friends with the people of the town, a pact which was never broken by any of them. Then we set out for Sempoala by another road, and passed through two towns friendly to Sincapasinga, where we rested, for the sun was very hot, and we were wearied with carrying our arms on our backs. A soldier took two chickens from an Indian house in one of the towns, and Cortez, who happened to see it, was so enraged at that soldier for stealing chickens in a friendly town, before his very eyes, that he immediately ordered a halter to be put around his neck, and he would have been hanged there if Pedro de Alvarado, who chanced to be near Cortez, had not cut the halter with his sword when the poor soldier was half dead. When we had left those towns in peace and continued our march towards Sempoala, we met the fat cacique and other chiefs waiting for us in some huts with food, for although they were Indians, they saw and understood that justice is good and sacred, and that the words Cortez had spoken to them, that we had come to right wrongs and abolish tyranny, were in conformity with what had happened on that expedition, and they were better affected towards us than ever before. We slept the night in those huts, and all the caciques bore us company all the way to our quarters in their town. They were really anxious that we should not leave their country, as they were fearful that Montezuma would send his warriors against them, and they said to Cortez that as we were already their friends, they would like to have us for brothers, and that it would be well that we should take from them their daughters, so as to have children by them, and to cement our friendship. They brought eight damsels, all of them daughters of caciques, and gave one of these to the caciques, who was the niece of the fat cacique, to Cortez, and one who was the daughter of another great cacique was given to Alonso Hernandez Puerto Carrero. All eight of them were clothed in the rich garments of the country, beautifully ornamented, as is their custom. Each one of them had a golden collar around her neck and golden earrings in her ears, and they came accompanied by other Indian girls who were to serve as their maids. When the fat cacique presented them, he said to Cortez, Tecle, which in their language means lord, these seven women are for your captains, and this one, who is my niece, is for you, and she is the senora of towns and vassals. Cortez received them with a cheerful countenance, and thanked the caciques for the gifts. But he said that before he could accept them and become brothers, they must get rid of those idols which they believed in and worshipped, and which kept them in darkness, and must no longer offer sacrifices to them, and that when he could see those cursed things thrown to the ground and an end put to the sacrifices, that when our bonds of brotherhood would be most firmly tied. He added that these damsels must become Christians before we could receive them. Every day we saw sacrificed before us three, four, or five Indians whose hearts were offered to the idols and their blood plastered on the walls, and the feet, arms, and legs of the victims were cut off and eaten, just as in our country we eat beef brought from the butchers. I even believe that they sell it by retail in the Tiangue, as they call their markets. Cortez told them that if they gave up these evil deeds and no longer practiced them, not only would we be friends, but we would make them lords over other provinces. All the caciques, priests, and chiefs replied that it did not seem to them good to give up their idols and sacrifices, and that these gods of theirs gave them health and good harvests, and everything of which they had need. When Cortez, and all of us who had seen so many cruelties and infamies, which I have mentioned, heard that disrespectful answer, we could not stand it, and Cortez spoke to us about it, and reminded us of certain good and holy doctrines, and said, How can we ever accomplish anything worth doing, if, for the honor of God, we do not first abolish these sacrifices made to idols? And he told us to be all ready to fight, should the Indians try to prevent us. But even if it cost us our lives, the idols must come to the ground that very day. We were all armed, ready for a fight, as it was ever our custom to be so, and Cortez told the caciques that the idols must be overthrown. 
When they saw that we were in earnest, the fat cacique and his captains told all the warriors to get ready to defend their idols, and when they saw that we intended to ascend a lofty queue, which stood high and was approached by many steps, the fat cacique and the other chieftains were beside themselves with fury, and called out to Cortez to know why he wanted to destroy their idols, for if we dishonored them and overthrew them, that they would all perish, and we along with them. Cortez answered them in an angry tone, that he had already told them that they should offer no more sacrifices to those evil images, that our reason for removing them was that they should no longer be deluded, and that either way they themselves must remove the idols at once, or we should throw them out and roll them down the steps. And he added that we were no longer their friends, but their mortal enemies, for he had given them good advice which they would not believe. Besides, he had seen their companies come armed for battle, and he was angry with them, and would make them pay for it by taking their lives. When the Indians saw Cortez uttering these threats, and our interpreter Doña Marina knew well how to make them understood, and even threatened them with the power of Montezuma which might fall on them any day, out of fear of all this, they replied that they were not worthy to approach their gods, and that if we wished to overthrow them it was not with their consent, but that we could overthrow them and do what we chose. The words were hardly out of their mouths before more than fifty of us soldiers had clambered up to the temple and had thrown down their idols which came rolling down the steps, shattered to pieces. The idols looked like fearsome dragons as big as calves, and there were other figures, half men and half great dogs of hideous appearance. When they saw their idols broken to pieces, the caciques and priests who were with them wept and covered their eyes, and in the Totonac language, they prayed their gods to pardon them, saying that the matter was no longer in their hands, and they were not to blame, but these Teules who had overthrown them, and that they did not attack us on account of the fear of the Mexicans. When this was over, the captains of the Indian warriors, who, as I have said, had come already to attack us, began to prepare to shoot arrows at us, and when we saw this, we laid our hands on the fat cacique and the six priests and some other chiefs, and Cortez cried out, that on the least sign of hostility they would all be killed. Then the fat cacique commanded his men to retire from our front, and not attempt to fight. When the caciques, priests, and chieftains were silenced, Cortez ordered all the idols which we had overthrown and broken to pieces to be taken out of sight and burned. Then eight priests who had charge of the idols came out of a chamber and carried them back to the house whence they had come, and burned them. These priests wore black cloaks like cassocks and long gowns reaching to their feet, and some had hoods like those worn by cannons, and others had smaller hoods like those worn by Dominicans, and they wore their hair very long, down to the waist, with some even reaching down to the feet, covered with blood, and so matted together that it could not be separated. And their ears were cut to pieces by way of sacrifice, and they stank like sulfur, and they had another bad smell like carrion, and as they said, and we learned that it was true, those priests were the sons of chiefs, and they abstained from women, and they fasted on certain days, and what I saw them eat was the pith of seeds of cotton, when the cotton was being cleaned. But they may have eaten other things which I did not see. Cortez made them a good speech through our interpreters, and told them that now we would treat them as brothers, and would help them all, all we could, against Montezuma and his Mexicans, and we had already sent to tell him not to make war on them or levy tribute, and that as now they were not to have any more idols in their lofty temples. He wished to leave them with the great lady who was the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we believe in and worship. He told them many things about our holy religion as well, stated as only a priest could do it nowadays, so that it was listened to with good will. Then he ordered all the Indian masons in the town to bring plenty of lime so as to clean the place and clear away the blood which encrusted the queues, and to clean them thoroughly. The next day, when they were whitewashed, an altar was set up, and he told the people to adorn the altar with garlands and always keep the place swept and clean. He then ordered four of the priests to have have their hair shorn and to change their garments and clothe themselves in white, and always keep themselves clean and he placed them in charge of the altar and of that sacred image of Our Lady, so that it should be looked after well. He left there as hermit one of our soldiers named Juan de Torres de Cordova, who was old and lame. 
He ordered our carpenters to make a cross and place it on a stone support, which we had already built and plastered over. The next morning, Mass was celebrated at the altar by Padre Fray Bartolome del Medo, and then an order was given to fumigate the holy image of Our Lady and the sacred cross with the incense of the country, and we showed them how to make candles of the native wax, and ordered these candles always to be kept burning on the altar, for up to that time they did not know how to use the wax. The most important chieftains of the town, and of others who had come together, were present at the Mass. At the same time the eight Indian damsels were brought to be made Christians, for they were still in the charge of their parents and uncles, and they were admonished about many things touching our holy religion, and were then baptized. The niece of the fat cacique was named Doña Catalina, and she was very ugly. She was led by the hand and given to Cortez, who received her and tried to look pleased. The daughter of the great cacique Cuesco was named Doña Francisca. She was very beautiful for an Indian, and Cortez gave her to Alonso Hernandez Puerto Carrero. I cannot now recall to mind the names of the other six, but I know that Cortez gave them to different soldiers. When this had been done, we took leave of all the caciques and chieftains, who from that time forward always showed us goodwill, especially when they saw that Cortez received their daughters, and that we took them away with us, and after Cortez had repeated his promises of assistance against their enemies, we set out for our town of Villarica. After we had finished our expedition, and the people of Sempoala and Sincapasinga had been reconciled to one another, and had given their fealty to his majesty, and all the other things that I have told about what happened, we returned to our settlement, and took with us certain chieftains from Sempoala. On the day of our arrival there came into port a ship from the island of Cuba, under the command of Francisco de Sacedo. At the same time there arrived Louis Marin, a man of great merit, and ten soldiers, Sacedo brought a horse, and Louis Marine a mare, and they brought from Cuba the news that the decree had reached Diego Velasquez from Spain, giving him authority to trade and found settlements, at which his friends were greatly rejoiced, all the more when they learned that he had received his commission appointing him Adelantado of Cuba. Being in that town without any plans beyond finishing the fort, for we were still at work on it, most of his soldiers suggested to Cortez to let the fort stand as it was, for a memorial, it was just ready to be roofed, for we had already been over three months in the country, and it seemed to us better to go and see what this great Montezuma might be like, and to earn an honest living, and to make our fortune, but that we, before we started on our journey we should send out salutations to his majesty the emperor, and give him an account of all that had happened since we left the island of Cuba. It also began to be debated whether we should send to his majesty all the gold that we had received, both what we had got from barter, as well as the presents that Montezuma had sent us. Cortez replied that it was a very wise decision, and that he had already talked to some of the gentlemen about it, and that, as perchance in this matter of the gold, there might be some soldiers who wished to keep their shares, and if it were divided up there would be very little to send, that for this reason... He had appointed Diego de Orda and Francisco de Montejo, who were good men of business, to go from soldier to soldier among those whom it was suspected would demand their share of the gold, and say these words, Sirs, if you already know that we wish to send his majesty a present of the gold which we have obtained, dear, and as it is the first treasure that we are sending from this land, it ought to be much greater that it seems to us that we should all place at his service the portions that fall to our share. We gentlemen and soldiers who have here written our names have signed as not wishing to take anything, but to give it all voluntarily to his majesty, so that we may bestow favors on us. If anyone wishes for his share, it will not be refused him, but whoever renounces it, let him do as we have all done, and sign here. In this way, they all signed, to a man. When this was settled, Alonso Hernandez Puerto Carrero and Francisco de Montejo were chosen as proctors to go to Spain, for Cortes had already given them over two thousand dollars to keep them in his interest. The best ship in the fleet was got ready, and two pilots were appointed, one of them being Anton de Alaminos, who knew the passage through the Bahama Channel, for he was the first man to sail through it, and fifteen sailors were told off and a full supply of ship stores given to them. When everything was ready, we agreed to write to tell His Majesty all that had happened. 
Cortez wrote on his own account, so he told us an accurate narrative of the events. But we did not see his letter. The Cabildo wrote a letter jointly with ten of the soldiers from among those who wished to settle in the land, and had appointed Cortez as their general, and the letter was drawn up with great accuracy so that nothing was omitted, and I put my signature to it, and besides these letters and narratives, all the captains and soldiers wrote together another letter. Besides these narratives, we begged His Majesty, until he be pleased to order otherwise, to grant the government to Hernando Cortez, with the greatest respect and humility, as well as we were able, and as was proper. Within four days of the departure of our proctors to present themselves before our Lord the Emperor, some of the friends and dependents of Diego Velasquez, named Pedro Escudero, Juan Cermeño, and Gonzalo de Umbria, a pilot, and a priest named Juan Diaz, and certain sailors who called themselves Peñates, who bore Cortes ill will, determined to seize a small ship and sail to Cuba, to give notice to Diego Velasquez and advise him how he might have an opportunity of capturing our proctors with all the gold and the messages. These men had already got their stores in the ship and made other preparations, and the time being past midnight, were ready to embark when one of them seems to have repented of his wish to return to Cuba and went to report the matter to Cortez. When Cortez heard of it, and learned how many there were, and why they wished to get away, and who had given counsel, and held the threads of the plot, he ordered the sails, compass, and rudder to be removed at once from the ship, and they had the men arrested, and all their confessions taken down. They all told the truth, and their confessions involved in their guilt, others who were remaining with us, but Cortez kept this quiet at the time, as there were no other course open to him. The sentence which Cortez delivered was that Pedro Escudero and Juan Cermeño should be hanged, and that the pilot Gonzalo de Umbria should be should have his feet cut off, and the sailors Peñates should receive two hundred lashes each, and Father Juan Diaz, but for the honor of the church, would have been punished as well, as it was he gave him a great fright. I remember that when Cortez signed that sentence, he said with great grief and sighs, Would that I did not know how to write, so as not to have to sign away men's lives. As soon as the sentence was carried out, Cortez rode off at breakneck speed for Sempuala, which was five leagues distant, and ordered two hundred of his soldiers and all the horsemen to follow him. Being in Sempuala, as I have stated, and discussing with Cortez questions of warfare, and our advance into the country, and going on from one thing to another, we, who were his friends, counseled him, although others opposed it, not to leave a single ship at the port, but to destroy them all at once, so as to leave no source of trouble behind, lest, when we were inland, others of our people should rebel like the last. Besides, we should gain much additional strength from the masters, pilots, and sailors, who number nearly one hundred men, and they would be better employed helping us watch and fight than remaining in port. As far as I can make out, this matter of destroying the ships which we suggested to Cortez during our conversation had already been decided on by him, but he wished it to appear as though it came from us, so that if anyone should ask him to pay for the ships, he could say that he had acted on our advice, and we would all be concerned in their payment. Then he sent Juan de Escalante to Villarica, with orders to bring on shore all the anchors, cables, sails, and everything else on board which might prove useful, and then to destroy the ships and preserve nothing but the boats, and that the pilots, sailing masters and sailors, who were old and of no use for war, should stay at the town, and with the two nets they possessed, should undertake the fishing, for there was always fish in that harbor, although they were not very plentiful. Juan de Escalante did all that he was told to do, and soon after arrived at Sempoala, with a company of sailors whom he had brought from the ships, and some of them turned out to be very good soldiers. When this was done, Cortez sent to summon all the caciques of the hill towns who were lied to us, and in rebellion against Montezuma, and told them how they must give their service to the Spaniards who remained in Villarica to finish building the church, fortress, and towns. And Cortez took Juan de Escalante by the hand before them all and said to them, This is my brother, and told them to do whatever he should order them, and that they should need protection or assistance against the Mexicans, they should go to him, 
and he would come in person to their assistance. All the caciques willingly promised to do what might be asked of them, and I remember that they at once fumigated Juan de Escalante with incense, although he did not wish it done. Escalante was a man well qualified for any post, and a great friend of Cortez, so he could place him in command of the town and harbor with confidence, so that if Diego Velasquez should send an expedition there, it would meet with resistance. When the ships had been destroyed, with our full knowledge, one morning after we had heard mass, when all the captains and soldiers were assembled and were talking to Cortez about military matters, he begged us to listen to him and argued with us as follows. We all understood what was the work that lay before us, and that with the help of our Lord Jesus Christ we must conquer in all the battles and encounters that fell to our lot and must be as ready for them as was befitting, for if we were anywhere defeated, which, pray God, would not happen, we could not raise our heads again, as we were so few in numbers, and we could look for no help or assistance but that which came from God, for we no longer possess ships in which to return to Cuba, but must rely on our own good swords and stout hearts. And he went on to draw many comparisons and relate the heroic deeds of the Romans, one and all, we answered him that we would obey his orders, though the die was cast for good fortune, as Caesar said when he crossed the Rubicon, and that we were all of us ready to serve God and the king. After this excellent speech, which was delivered with more honeyed words and greater eloquence than I can express here, Cortez at once sent for the fat cacique and reminded him that we should treat the church and cross with great reverence and keep them clean. And he also told him that he meant to depart at once from Mexico to order Montezuma not to rob or offer human sacrifices, and that he now had need of two hundred Indian carriers to transport his artillery. He also asked fifty of the leading warriors to go with us. Just as we were ready to set out, a soldier whom Cortez had sent to Villarica with orders for some of his men remaining there to join him, returned from the town bearing a letter from Juan de Escalante saying that there was a ship sailing along the coast, and that he had made smoke signals and others, and he believed that they had seen his signals, but that they did not wish to come into the harbor, and that he had sent some Spaniards to watch to what place the ship should go, and they had reported that the ship had dropped anchor near the mouth of a river distant about three leagues, and that he wished to know what he should do. When Cortez had read the letter, he had once ordered Pedro de Alvarado to take charge of all his army at Sempoala, and with him Gonzalo de Sandoval. This was the first time that Sandoval was given a command. Then Cortez rode off at once in company with four horsemen, leaving orders for fifty of the most active soldiers to follow him, and he named those of us who were to form this company. That same night we arrived at Villarica. When we reached Villarica, Juan de Escalante came to speak to Cortez and said that it would be as well to go to the ship that night, lest she should set sail and depart, and that he would go and do this with twenty soldiers while Cortez rested himself. Cortez replied that he could not rest, that a lame goat must not nap, that he would go in person with the soldiers he had brought with him. So before we could get a mouthful of food, we started to march along the coast, and on the road we came on four Spaniards who had come to take possession of the land, in the name of Francisco de Gre, the governor of Jamaica. When Cortez heard this, and knew that de Gre was staying behind in Jamaica and sending captains to do the work, he asked by what right and title those captains came. The four men replied that in the year 1518, as the fame of the lands we had discovered had spread throughout the islands, that then Gre had information that he could beg from his majesty the right to all the country he could discover from the Rio San Pedro and San Pablo towards the north. As Garay had friends at court who could support his petition, he hoped to obtain their assistance, and he sent his mayor Domo to negotiate the matter. And this man brought back a commission for him as adelantado and governor of all the land he could discover north of the Rio San Pedro and San Pablo. Under this commission he had once dispatched three ships, with about two hundred and seventy soldiers and supplies and horses, under the captain Alonso Lavarez Pinedo, who was settling on the Rio Panuco, about seventy leagues away. And these Spaniards said that they were merely doing what their captains told them to do, and were in no way to blame. When Cortez had learned their business, he cajoled them with many flattering speeches, and asked them whether we could capture the ship, Guillén de la Loa, who was the leader of the four men, answered that they could wave to the ship and do what they could, but although they shouted and waved their cloaks and made signals, 
they would not come near. For as those men said, their captain knew that the soldiers of Cortez were in the neighborhood and had warned them to keep clear of us. When we saw that they would not send a boat, we understood that they must have seen us from the ship as we came along the coast, and that unless we could trick them, they would not send the boat ashore again. Cortez asked the four men to take off their clothes so that four of our men could put them on, and when this was done, we returned along the coast the way we had come, so that a return could be seen from the ship and those on board might think that we had really gone away. Four of us soldiers remained behind, wearing the other men's clothes, and we remained hidden in the wood with Cortez until past midnight. And then, when the moon set, it was dark enough to return to the mouth of the creek, but we kept well hidden so that only the four soldiers could be seen. When the dawn broke, the four soldiers began to wave their cloaks to the ship, and six sailors put off from her in a boat. Two of the sailors jumped ashore to fill two jugs with water, and we who were with Cortez kept in hiding, waiting for the other sailors to land. But they stayed where they were, and our four soldiers who were wearing the clothes of Gerhay's people pretended that they were washing their hands and kept their faces hidden. The men in the boat cried out, Come on board, what are you doing? Why don't you come? One of our men answered, Come on shore for a minute and you will see. As they did not know his voice, they pushed off with their boat, and although we shouted at them, they would answer nothing. We wanted to shoot at them with muskets and crossbows, but Cortez would not allow it, and said, Let them go in peace and report to their captain. So six soldiers from that ship remained in our company, the four we had first captured, and the two sailors who had come ashore. And we returned to Villarica without having had anything to eat since we first started. When our departure for Mexico had received full consideration, we sought advice as to the road we should take, and the chieftains of Sempoala were agreed that the best and most convenient road was through the province of Tlaxcala, for the Tlaxcalans were their allies and mortal enemies of the Megans. Forty chieftains, all warriors, who were already prepared to accompany us and were great assistance to us on that journey, and they provided us as well with two hundred carriers to transport our artillery. We poor soldiers had no need of help, for at that time we had nothing to carry except our arms, lances, muskets, crossbows, shields, and the like, with which we both marched and slept, and we were shod with hemp and shoes, and were always prepared for a fight. In the middle of August 1519, we set out for Sempoala, keeping always in good formation, with scouts and some of the most active soldiers in advance. The first day, we marched toward a town named Jalapa, and thence to Sokoshima, a strong place with a difficult approach, and inside there were many vines of the grapes of the country on trellises. In both these towns, through our interpreters, all matters touching our religion were explained to the people and that we were the vassals of the Emperor Don Carlos, who had sent us to put an end to human sacrifices and robbery. As they were friends of the Sempoalans and did not pay tribute to Montezuma, we found them very well disposed towards us, that they provided us with food. A cross was erected in each town, and its meaning was explained to them, and they were told to hold it in great reverence. Beyond Sogoshima, we crossed some high mountain ranges by a pass and arrived at another town named Teshutla, where we were also well received, for like the others, they paid no tribute to Mexico. On leaving that town, we finished the ascent of the mountains and entered an uninhabited country, and it was very cold, and hail and rain fell that night. There was a great scarcity of food, and a wind came down from the snowy hills on one side of us, which made us shiver with cold. As we had come from the coast, which is very hot, and had nothing with which to cover ourselves, only our armor. We suffered from the frost, for we were not accustomed to a different temperature. Then we entered another pass where there were some hamlets and large temples with idols, and they had great piles of firewood for the service of the idols, which were kept in those temples, but still there was nothing to eat, and the cold was intense. We next entered into the land belonging to the town of Xocotlan, and we sent two Sempoala Indians to advise the caciques how we were faring so that the people might receive us favorably. This town was subject to Mexico, so we always marched on the alert and in good order, for we could see that we were already in a different sort of country, 
and when we saw the white gleam of the rooftops, the houses of the caciques, and the queues in numerous oratories, which were very lofty and covered with white plaster, they looked very pleasing, like a town of our Spain. So we called the place Castil Blanco, and so it is called to this day. And when, through our messengers, they knew that we were approaching, the cacique and other chieftains came out to meet us close by their houses. The name of the cacique was Olintecle, and he conducted us to some lodgings and gave us food, but there was very little of it, and it was given with ill will. As soon as we had eaten, Cortez asked through our interpreters about their lord Montezuma. The chief told us of his great strength in warriors, which he kept in all the provinces under his sway, without counting many other armies which were posted on the frontiers and in the neighboring provinces. And he, the chief, then spoke of the great fortress of Mexico, and how the houses were built in the water, and how one could only pass from one house to another by means of bridges or canoes, and how all the houses have flat roofs, which, by raising breastworks when they are needed, can be turned into fortresses. That the city is entered by three causeways, each causeway having four or five openings in it through which the water can flow from one part to another, and each opening has a wooden bridge over it, so that when any one of those bridges is raised, no one can enter the city of Mexico. Then the chief told us of the great store of gold and silver, and chalchuite, stones and other riches within Mo which Montezuma, his lord, possessed, and he never ceased telling us how great a lord he was, so that Cortez and all of us marveled at hearing him. The more he told us about the great fortress and bridges, how such stuff are we Spanish soldiers made, the more we wanted to try our luck against them, although it seemed a hopeless enterprise. Judging from what Olintecle explained and told us, in reality, Mexico was much stronger and had better munitions and defenses than anything he told us about, for it is one thing to have seen the place itself and its strength, and quite another thing to describe it as I do. He added that Montezuma was so great a prince that he placed anything he chose under his rule, and that he did not know if he would be pleased when he heard of our stay in that town that we had been given lodgings and food without his permission. Cortez replied through our interpreters, I would have you know that we have come from distant lands at the order of our lord and king, who was many and great princes as his vassals, and he sends us to command your great prince Montezuma not to sacrifice or kill any more Indians, or to rob his vassals, or to seize any more lands, but to give his fealty to our lord the king. And now I say the same to you, Olindegle, and to all the other caciques who are with you. Desist from your sacrifices, and no longer eat the flesh of your own relations, and the other evil customs which you practice. For such is the will of our Lord God, whom we believe in and worship, the giver of life and death, who will take us up to heaven. To all of which things, they made no reply. Cortez said to the soldiers who were present around him, It seems to me, gentlemen, that there remains nothing for us to do but to set up a cross. But Padre Fray Bartolome de Olmedo replied, It seems to me, sir, that the time has not yet come to leave crosses in the charge of these people, for they are somewhat shameless and without fear, and as they are vassals of Montezuma, they may burn the crosses or do some other evil thing, and what you have said to them is enough until they know something more of our holy religion. So the matter was settled, and no cross was set up. I will go on to say that we had with us a very large lurcher, which belonged to Francisco de Lugo, which barked much of a night, and it seems that the caciques of the town asked our friends whom we had brought from Sempuala whether it was a tiger or a lion, or an animal with which to kill Indians, and they answered him, they take it with them to kill anyone who annoys them. They also asked what we did with the artillery we had brought with us, and the Sempuallans replied that with some stones which we put inside them, we could kill anyone we wished to kill, and that the horses ran like deer. They would catch anyone we were told to run after. Then Olintencle said to the other chiefs, Surely they must be Teules. Our Indian friends replied, so at last you have found it out. Take care not to do anything to annoy them, 
for they will know it at once. They even know one's thoughts. These Teules are those who captured the tax gatherers of your great Montezuma, and decreed that no more tribute should be paid throughout the Sierras, nor in our town of Sempoala. And they are the same who turned our Teules out of their temples and replaced them with their own gods, and who have conquered the people of Tabasco and Champoton. And they are so good that they have made friendship between us and the people of Sincapasinga. Uh, In addition to this, you have seen how the great Montezuma, notwithstanding all his power, has sent them golden cloth. And now they have come to your town, and we see that you have given them nothing. Run at once and bring them a present. It seems that we had brought some good advocates with us, for the townspeople soon brought us four pendants and three necklaces and some lizards, all made of gold, but all the gold was of poor quality. And they brought us four Indian women who were good for grinding maize for bread, and one load of cloth. Cortez received these things with a cheerful goodwill and with many expressions of thanks. I remember that in the plaza where some of their oratories stood, there were piles of human skulls so regularly arranged that one could count them, and I estimated them at more than a hundred thousand. I repeat again that there were more than one hundred thousand of them. And in another part of the plaza, there were so many piles of dead men's thigh bones that one could not count them. There was also a large number of skulls strung between beams of wood, and three priests who had charge of these bones and skulls were guarding them. We had occasion to see many such things later on, as we penetrated into the country for the same custom, was observed in all the towns, including those of Tlaxcala. After all that I have related had happened, we determined to set out on the road to Tlaxcala with our friends told us was very near, and that the boundary was close by where some boundary stones were placed to mark it. So we asked the cacique of the Tencle, which was the best and most level road to Mexico, and he replied the road which passed by the large town named Cholula. And the simple Wallen said to Cortez, Sir, do not go by Cholula, for the people there are treacherous, and Montezuma always keeps a large garrison of warriors in that town. And they advised us to go by way of Tlaxcala, where the people were their friends and enemies of the Mexicans. So we agreed to take the advice of the Sempoalans, trusting that God would direct us. Cortez demanded of Olatencle twenty warrior chiefs to go with us, and he gave them at once. The next morning we set out for Tlaxcala and arrived at a little town belonging to the people of Zalashinko.